Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. But today we're gonna, I'm gonna answer a post that was posted on Twitter. Uh, it's written in a book by Morgan Housel. And I, I wanna dive into this and show you guys something. Uh, this is something that really opened my eyes. This is probably, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, all right? And this is one of the things that really made me dive into researching uh, economics and finance. Um, it deals with currencies. And when I started looking at currencies and finance, I realized that this, the, the, from the political aspect, the Federal Reserve, all these different things, they're just stealing from the citizens. They're stealing money. And it's very difficult to maintain or grow purchasing power across time. So I dove into this uh, a while back and it, it brought this back up um, to talk about this because it was written in this book and I saw this post with a tweet on it that kind of sparked my interest to talk about it with everyone on the channel. Um, this is what made me really skeptical of governments. It's probably, probably about at least 10 years ago. I, whatever it is, about 10, about, I was probably around 30 years old, maybe it's 12 years ago or something like that. And uh, I'll show you what makes me skeptical and which kind of pisses me off, uh, I'll be honest. Um, so you guys can see it. You guys, you'll know the data here after I show it. Uh, when I looked into the data uh, all throughout the time, this is, this is what really made me the most kind of ticked off <laughs> as I looked at data. So uh, we'll dive in here. We'll take a look at it and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. And this is one of the things that led to me um, being so heavy in precious metals. I know some people made some comments like, oh, well, he's got, you know, 20, 30% in precious metals, physical precious metals. And this is the reason why. Um, I'm going to show you the data. I'll lay it out. I don't know if I've talked about this either, uh, but this is just piecing in for, you know, together information. Uh, I'm an engineering background, not that that matters, but what you do is you look at the given. The given is a bunch of information that is shared with you. Uh, and then you go research all this information and then you can draw a conclusion from the information. Uh, engineering, you just use a bunch of equations. Uh, you have the provided data or the given of information. You lay it out, you use your equations to come to a potential outcome, uh, a solution, a direction to go, a thing to test, whatever it is. So uh, that's what we're going to do real quick. I'll show you some of the data, kind of piecing this stuff together, and I'm sure you'll piece it together if I lay the data out a certain way for you. And uh, why I migrated towards more physical metals uh, being a larger portion of my portfolio, why I reject or dislike bonds, uh, and even the S&P 500. I'll show you why uh, I think that. <clears throat> so let's dive in here uh, and let's see what data I've got. Again, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at finding underscore finance. And if you want to join our community, it's finding hyphen value.com. And that's where we talk about individual companies, sectors, and what is in my portfolio. So uh, let's go down. And this is the tweet that sparked my, uh, <laughs> my emotion, I, I would say. Uh, it says, my favorite Morgan Housel tweet. It says, a book called Shut Up and Wait. Each page is just this chart. S&P 500 total return coming from 1871 all the way upwards. Now, people look at this and they say, wow, that's great. I just need to wait. I just need to be able to uh, invest for the long term. I need to, uh, if I buy it, you know, when it's coming down, I just need to wait so I can hold it and hold it and hold it for a long period of time. So what I did is I looked at, uh, I, you know, obviously I, I've seen this S&P 500. This is what it is. It looks like this on the logarithmic chart. Uh, and you've got your commodity booms and all of these little um, spots that are going sideways. Uh, it's an increasing interest rate environment under a larger uh, loaning uh, time frame for at least things after 1970 it is. Loans, loans, and then again, it'll be fiscal spending and or loans or a debt crisis that eventually comes. But if you were to strip out the actual inflation rate out of these things, what is the actual purchasing power returns? 
Um, that was something I did when I was looking at the potential returns out of the S&P 500. So um, I wanted to kind of dive into this and see, you know, is this giving actual purchasing power returns here? Or is it all just an illusion? Is it a, an illusion that inflation is carrying the S&P 500 higher? And what portion of the S&P 500 returns is actual returns in purchasing power. And that is what I was trying to get to. That's what I was looking at for some of the things I was researching for a potential strategy to play the real estate cycle. Is the S&P 500 an actual good spot to be uh, for a long-term buy and hold strategy? If I bought it here, would it matter if I held through this all the way through? Um, and my answer is, Yes, it does matter. Because if you strip away the inflation and then you strip away your after tax returns, you're left with, well, you're left with actually losing money. So the S&P 500 doesn't actually keep up with inflation. And I'll just show you some averages. And you guys can figure out you know, for yourself uh, about this. So if I were to look at the S&P, uh, I pulled it up, S&P 500 average return. So from the S&P dates back into the 1920s, become a composite index tracking 90 stocks in 1926. The average annualized return since its inception in 1928 through December 2022 is 9.81%. Your average is 9.81%. So that is roughly what the S&P 500 is the average over that long period of time. So then I went in and I looked at it and said, okay, well, what's the inflation, the actual inflation calculated on the 1980s based stats here. Now, if you go back to 1999, 98, and you look forward, uh, well, the average inflation rate since about 1999, and I'm choosing 1999 because that's when I graduated high school. That is when I have basically my invest, investing start occur. And at that time, if you use the official Shadow Stats 1980 base calculation, your inflation rate is on average 10%. 10%. Well, if it's 10%, and then if your average return through this period is about 9.81%, and your inflation rate's 10%, and you have to pay, the, if it's long term capital gains tax of 15%, well, your returns are actually lower than the inflation rate using the S&P 500. Because if you have a 9.81 average, then you take taxes after you've been holding that and the inflation rate is 10%, well, crap, you're actually losing purchasing power gains. You're giving the purchasing power that you're investing in the S&P 500 to the government through inflation and on top of it, you have to pay taxes on those gains, those hypothetical gains that they <clears throat> hypothetically uh, you're achieving. Because if everything is coming from inflation, then your gains are all nominal and hypothetical. They're not actually purchasing power gains. So then I looked at what gold returned. And gold returned from 71 to 2022 Gold had an annual average return of 7.8%. Now, the thing that makes this kind of weird is that gold is in absolute cheapness in comparison to stocks. Stocks are, have never been priced as expensive as they are. So you're taking an expensively priced return of 9.81 on an average annual basis to what is compared to be one of the cheapest assets in the world at 7.8% given the market conditions and the lowering of interest rates through the 40 year period. So <clears throat> here's the thing, you can't really keep pace with inflation with gold, uh, but I, will think, I do think it's gonna keep pace with inflation here shortly. And you definitely can't keep pace with inflation at the S&P 500, which is in total bubble territory. And in total bubble territory, it couldn't keep pace with inflation over that long period of time. It can in the short term, 
if you invest in these using the real estate cycle to actually increase its purchasing power over those given periods of time. So if you were to take, and people are talking about the Kondratiev wave that started in uh, 1998. So if I were to compare gold, this is the gold futures price. And remember, it is cheap as all get out uh, to the S&P 500. So if I, were to, if I were to start that location at the beginning of the commodities bull market in 1998, where that ratio was, um, it looks something on the lines like this. If I got it lined up, it's somewhere in that range there. So when we started that Kondratiev wave, um, gold has outperformed the S&P 500 in terms of returns from the beginning of the Kondratiev wave of, the, of 1998, 99, 2000, depending on where you start it. And, the, and gold has outperformed the S&P 500. Bonds don't even come close to anything. They're basically just a placeholder for the government to, to, to take money from people. I mean, there's bonds down here. Um, that's not even close to keeping pace with inflation. So what I did is I said, well, if it's not keeping pace with inflation and I, I can hold this stuff outside of the system, which is very hard to tax if they get desperate in terms of literally stealing money, not just out of the currency, but out of potential you know, brokerage accounts and taxing unrealized gains and all the stuff that they have talked about. Well, I could hold it and beat the S&P 500 with gold. So what I did is I looked at strategies to develop where I could swap between metals. Um, and obviously I can put up you know, a, a chart of palladium. Uh, that's obviously far exceeding the returns of the S&P 500 under certain market conditions. You can put up silver, and that is obviously put up very good numbers under certain periods of market conditions. Uh, and then what I did is I looked at the ratios to say, I want to be in silver during this run here, swap it to something else like maybe perhaps palladium. Uh, so you buy palladium here and here and ride it up here and then swap it when it's up here to another metal. Uh, maybe that is silver. It was platinum that I did it with, but let's say it's gold or silver that you swap it back into as it's low. And then this will outperform here as palladium is down. Um, and that's a way that you can take the least amount of risk and generate the most amount of returns in an environment where the S&P 500 isn't even keeping up with inflation, not to mention the after-tax returns. And the thing that pisses me off that, you know, this bad, um, it's nothing with anybody, the viewers or anything like that. It's just looking at data and looking at all this stuff in history. What pisses me off the most is that they're basically not even giving us a chance. Because if you think about it, I mean, think about it in, in true honesty here. Um, if the inflation rate is really 10% and you have to pay taxes on whatever gains you have, they're number one, taxing you on those gains immediately. Then whatever you buy, well, that's all going to get taxed too, because one, you pay a sales tax, two, you're going to pay the taxes of all the corporations that make those things. Because inherently, everything that is taxed in a corporation is paid by the end user. It's paid by the customer, whoever uses that product or service. So not only did they take that, they're also pumping all of the prices higher when you, when you can't even get the return on your returns to keep pace with your purchasing power. So not only do they steal it from the, the aspect of the currency itself, then you can't invest and keep pace with it. Then they tax the money that you, that you invest then you have to buy all of the taxes and all of the, the, the corporate taxes and all of the taxes on the, 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 the properties that these companies own, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all paid through the purchase price of those things. And they tax that and they tax the corporate. I mean, this is all ridiculous, guys. You're talking, we're getting taxed way higher than anything that people can imagine. It's probably 80 or 90%. Because they're stealing it through your currency. And then they, they tax you on every aspect of the corporate businesses. 
because the end user pays that, not, not the corporate. The corporate worlds don't pay those taxes. It's the end user. So then I had to figure out a way to do this basically out of the system to think, how do I do ratios? How do I get out of the system to protect the assets and my purchasing power? And then how do I develop a strategy to grow it? Now, I'm not saying to avoid taxes, not the point of this. But at the point is, you know, a lot of people make it seem a lot easier. Then you dive into it. And then you say, okay, well, what are the, what's the actual purchasing power returns of the S&P 500? Oh, it's great. It's negative. They are literally stealing the purchasing power out of all these things. Now, you can also beat all this if you were to invest using the real estate cycle and invest in commodities during this time frame. So if you were to invest in commodities, and I'll just throw up something, all right, um, to compare. I'll just throw up crude oil, all right? So here's crude oil overlaid. Um, so if I were to basically invest in crude oil during this time frame, you invest and you ride it up, and then you sell crude oil through this you know, time frame here. You buy the S&P 500 down here, and then you ride it on up. Uh, and now we should be riding crude oil from basically this point here is where I purchased it. And we're riding it back up. And this is going to keep continue to go way, way higher. I think that the fractal that we see here, if I were to do this, uh, is, let me pull the fractal here real quick, guys. Uh, what I think is occurring based off of the trading, oh crap, I don't want that. I want something else here. One second, guys. Oh, I, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the S&P 500 here. Let me, um, <clears throat> let me swap these real quick. So there's the S&P and there's crude oil. Uh, what I think will occur uh, based off of this, and I'm just using crude oil, is this is the fractal. And I think that this fractal uh, is uh, based off of where we're at in the cycle and doing all this research. I think that that is what the potential occurrence will be. It will be something on the lines of this. And I took this move here, the last bull market, and overlaid it. This here is your expansionary phase of real estate where the stock market goes up. And then you want to swap here and here is your swap point. That is the ratios and the power of using ratios. Now, you, here's the thing. And I've done all this analysis. I've done all this crap, right? A buy and hold investor will not make money, will not make purchasing power gains. You have to adopt this method if you want to make purchasing power gains. If you actually want to increase your purchasing power, if you want to go buy more oil, if you want to go buy more real estate, if you want to buy an actual amount more of that other thing, you have to be invested in items that go up faster. So for instance, <clears throat> uh, and I will show you here in a, using a ratio, people probably thought that they were making money during some of these areas like, oh, I made money. Uh, in this section here. The problem is you could purchase less crude oil as this went up. You were losing purchasing power of crude oil. You're losing purchasing power of all these things that are inflating at a faster rate than the S&P 500. So what, what does this look like in terms of oil? What would a potential price projection be with this fractal that I just overlaid? And I know people get really interested. It's going to be $600 a barrel or $500 a barrel is probably my guess. Now, people are going to say that's absolutely ludicrous. How do people afford that? You're looking at it from the wrong aspect. You're looking at it from the prior 40 years that you've been looking and, and watching the markets. You're looking at the previous 40-year decline in interest rates uh, and where the value of the currency only went down 10% a year from 1998. What I'm saying is the value of the currency is going to cause this move, not necessarily crude oil itself. And that is a completely different viewpoint than what most people can, I think, comprehend. It's a debasement of the currency and it's coming. We're sitting on top of the pattern. If you were to look at ratios like crude oil or not crude oil, gold, here's gold divided by the M2 money supply. Crude divided by M2 money supply, this is what happened in the 1970s, this. And now we're in a double bottom. This is your, your, your long phase of coming back down, 
uh, and coming back around. They printed a bunch of money. <clears throat> We've broken out of the downtrend line here. It's ready to go up. It's ready to go up. Uh, what does this mean if this were to revaluate itself and they were to print no more money in the system? Um, and I don't even know if the M2 money supply here is an actual good measurement because they're probably tampering with the measurements because you don't know what to believe anymore. If I were to take it from this red line of where we're currently at, and if it were to repeat itself, it would have to go up 6x or 504%. 6x from the current gold price would put us at roughly $12,000 an ounce gold if this were to repeat and they weren't to print any more money, which we know they're printing copious amounts of money. So this, this will probably, in order to get to this ratio, the M2 money supply, here's the M2 money supply, has been going up at a rapid pace. So if this continues to go higher, which I think it will because of the design of the system, then that means that gold has to go far past $12,000 an ounce uh, to account for the money supply in that potential ratio if we were to go back to 1980. Um, will that occur? I don't know. But it's cheap and that is some of the ratios that I look at. Uh, they're probably going to fight that tooth and nail because gold is a measuring stick of inflation. They don't want to know, they don't want everyone to know the measuring stick is going up. So they're going to try to keep this thing down. Now, if you try to keep something down in the market, the market eventually will overpower them. They'll overpower them, it will crush them at some point. Uh, it becomes a waiting game. Just like Morgan Housel said uh, in his quote here, he said, a book called Shut Up and Wait, each page is just a chart, it says shut up and wait. My, my take is he used the wrong measuring stick. The S&P 500 is not the, the preferred vehicle of choice in these market conditions. The preferred vehicle of choice is gold. And that's why I chose gold and the ratio game and, and the certain percent allocation uh, that I have because I'm out of the system and it's playing a ratio game that still increases the purchasing power, uh, and I accumulate more ounces of metal, whatever that metal may be. I don't think the buy and hold strategy will work, <clears throat> perhaps for the rest of the system. Because the system, if the system doesn't, I mean, if the S&P 500 doesn't keep pace with the inflation, then what's the whole point of doing it? If you're not getting purchasing power gains. So, um, gold has been outperforming the S&P 500 ever since uh, the bottom of the gold market in 99, 2000. I think that's going to continue, as you can see with the ratios of gold versus the M2 money supply. Um, and then I think, you know, there's other opportunities. If you were to look at, say, the hyperinflation in Germany, where platinum outperformed gold by almost six times, about five and a half times which means platinum went up five and a half times the price of gold during that time frame. Will that occur again? I don't know. But are we coming to a point where we are gonna hit massive rates of inflation? Well, if we're at 10% inflation already, given the 1980 calculation, I'm willing to bet that we're gonna, that they're gonna have to hold, they're gonna have to hold the Fed, you know, federal funds rate and all these rates lower than the real rate of inflation. They're gonna lie about it, most likely. So the only way that I could figure out a good portfolio allocation uh, and the percentage is to put it at a level that I feel comfortable holding that protects my purchasing power. And, and then I also play the ratio game to increase the ounces. I'm sure you guys are wondering what the ratio game is. It's swapping metals back and forth. Um, and, and that's, that's what got me like kind of pissed off. <laughs> it, 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 triggered a, a thing because he just said, oh, you know, invest in the S&P 500 and wait for a very long time. It doesn't work if you, you, ha you have to adopt the strategy that basically I've adopted um, because that's where you get your purchasing power gains. There's no other way to do it. Uh, and it took me a long time to figure that out. It wasn't just, you know, listen to these people who write books, make money off their books, uh, and then give information that I think may or may not be uh, hundred percent accurate. They think it's accurate and I'm sure they're acting ethically and morally and stuff like that. But if you dig into it 
and you look at the purchasing power returns under a lot of these market conditions, it doesn't keep pace with inflation. So that's what I wanted to share. I'm just going to leave it at that. All right. Um, if you guys like the analysis, give me a thumb up, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the website. What I try to do, if I were to describe it, is I'm looking for stocks that are down, that are going to have massive moves to the upside, given certain market conditions. It's using ratios to identify what's cheap. Um, the returns will be massive if we get these types of market movements. Um, I'm using the business cycle, aka the real estate cycle, to get me in the ballpark of where to purchase these assets. I also use technical analysis to identify the ratio change and also looking for potential chart patterns in the charts themselves. Um, and if I were to give an example here, I can just use COPX and ETF. Um, this here is your, it's basically a, think of this as a falling wedge that uh, comes down here. So it comes into a wedge, it breaks out, comes back. Uh, this is your double bottom. It breaks out of the double bottom. Uh, and then you do a retest. So your buy points, if you're on top of it, your Kamai stock ratio is really cheap. So you could probably buy it somewhere in this range all in there. Another spot would be here. And even where it's at is a pretty good spot because this is going to go way, way, way up. Given the inflation that's coming and the market, the, the, the actual conditions in copper itself, the deficits that are coming. There's deficits in all these different commodities. Then you have to look at, I know this is getting kind of deep or whatever, but um, what can the world bear given our population? We're moving at exponential speeds, which I don't think people can understand. Um, they, they are very good at understanding linear movements. For instance, uh, and Morgan Housel brought this up uh, in one of his clips. I watch all these guys. I've watched them you know, over the years or whatever. Uh, he said, if you could understand eight plus eight plus eight plus eight, pretty easy to do the math, right? Well, what about eight times eight times eight times eight? You're not gonna be able to do it unless you are a genius or somebody who's really good at math. Uh, that can do it that quickly. So uh, we don't understand uh, exponential moves. And we are moving everything at an exponential speed using a percent increase of growth. Well, you have to keep in mind, one doubling away means that you have 50% capacity left. That's only one doubling away. And we're doubling a lot of this stuff every seven years, eight years in a lot of things. So that means that when you're at, you know, 25% and you have 75% of a commodity left, that means you're only 14 years away from a major problem, <laughs> a major problem. Um, you're probably, you're probably seven years away when you have 50% left because that's when you'll usually peak. And then maybe we can sustain it sideways, but you can't be, you won't be able to grow your production um, at the pace that the growth of your inputs would be in. And people would say that price would solve it. Um, I'm here to say that I don't know if it would. Because they say, oh, well, we'll just develop something else. Well, what if it's like 30 different commodities? What if it's one of your main commodities that gets all your other commodities, like oil or an energy source or coal? Um, and we're already seeing these types of depletions in coal, for example. Um, go look at China's energy content use and go look at the volume of coal that they're moving. They're moving more volumes and getting less energy back out of it. So their energy consumption you know, in coal might be doing this, might be slowing, but their volumes are rapidly increasing because they're using less energy dense coal in some of their, uh, for some of their uh, coal power plants. So we have to move harder and faster, move more tonnage uh, to get less energy back. That's your energy return on energy invested. So I did a lot of studying into that over the years uh, of energy return on energy invested. Uh, and then I paired it with the design of our system. The design of our system, our money system has to grow exponentially, but that cannot be paired and will not be paired with a gross domestic product. But that's your difference is the inflation rate. Never since 2000 or ever since about 2000, We've been growing the inflation at a faster pace than all these returns. It's hiding the true problem underneath. And if AI were, 
it, let's say it does come along and I'm, I'm not b a believer that it's going to go at this warp speed. And if it does, it does. It's going to put more pressure on the commodities themselves because all it's going to do is it's going to make everything more efficient. Uh, but it will not, you know, when, when you think of efficiency, you're thinking of coming up with the designs, but you still need materials to do it. Um, so then we'll have to figure out a, a way or a material that we just have like an infinite amount of materials from. Because wealth is really converting commodities into a product. And then all wealth comes from real estate or land. Because the minerals come from land or real estate. Um, and or you want to build a house on it, grow food from it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, ultimately, all money lands up in, in, uh, in land. All of it. Because that's where the minerals, that's where the natural resources, that's where the food is grown, that's where the houses are built. <laughs> it's it's all um, one big circle back to land as things feed through land. Um, so that's that's kind of, I don't know, I'm just kind of talking freely here. I uh, want to do a little bit different clip than just go over the uh, the Twitter updates. But I saw that on Twitter. It sparked a thing. I was like, you know what? I don't know if I've ever talked about the S&P 500 returns. Uh, why, you know, someone made a comment, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense that he's that much into gold, like I'm a scaredy cat or something. Well, actually, I think it's just logic. Um, the people who hide over in the S&P 500, uh, I've, in, in my opinion, from my holdings, I've decimated their returns, decimated their returns, decimated <laughs> in just my physical holdings. And that's where I got a, a ton of return and I didn't have to take any risk with it. Because it's the lower lowest risk thing that you can hold. There's no third party risk. The S and P 500. There's there's risk in it. There's tax risk. There's all sorts of stuff that you're exposed to. Well, anyway, uh, that's what I've got for today, guys. Um, I'll end it there. Give me a thumb up. We have a 5 p.m. question and answer session coming up uh, on Sunday, uh, Mountain Standard Time. Mountain Standard Time. That's 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Central, uh, 5 p.m. Mountain, and 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific. I know some people have some questions on that. So uh, that's what I've got for today. Uh, we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.